Hello, everyone. Um, I think we're just going to leave a few minutes for people to join us. Um, so if you are uh, joining us now, we're going to start in a couple of minutes. So just a few more seconds. Um, I think actually let's let's start. I'm going to give people a, a bit of time with some housekeeping to to start. So uh, please uh, feel free to ask any questions throughout the presentation today using the Q and A function that you can see on your screen. Um, you can send questions throughout the presentation, and we're going to address them all at the end. Um, lastly, also, um, just to let you know that this session is being recorded, uh, we will send the recording after um, to everyone who has registered and attended, um, and we'll also share some additional resources, so uh, look out for an email from us in the next few days. So I think we are ready to get started. Um, so first, again, welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar about integrating external resources into library instruction. Let's start with some introductions. So joining me today are Sarah and Anna. You can see them on the screen there. Um, Sarah is a librarian, educator, and curriculum designer whose work focuses on uh, critical information and media literacy, misinformation, civic engagement, student success, and library and information science education. She has held positions at Loyola University of Chicago, the University of Texas, and served as the head of instruction and engagement at the Emory University Libraries. Sarah has worked on curriculum projects uh, with partners that include the Mozilla Foundation and the Carter Center. She currently works as an instructional designer and consultant and is pursuing her PhD in communication and information sciences from the University of Alabama. We also have Anna today, who is a librarian with over 15 years of experience in academic libraries, including archives and special collections. During that time, she has served in leadership positions in both public service and collection development. She is passionate about staff training and development, library collections, and facilitating the work of library employees. In her current role as engagement librarian with SAGE, she supports academic libraries in the Central Plains and Northeast U US and Central Canada. For those who might not know SAGE Campus very well. Um, SAGE Campus is a library resource created by SAGE, uh, offering a suite of uh, online courses covering key skills and uh, research methods across all stages of academic study. Our courses are developed by experts such as Sarah, who is here today, um, and are self-paced to suit learners with busy schedules. I think we are now ready to start with the uh, discussion. So I'm going to hand it over to Sarah first. Uh, let me just stop sharing my screen. There we go. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you all for attending today. I'm excited to have this opportunity to uh, share a little bit about sort of the work and engage in conversation with Anna and the rest of you today. Um, so yeah, just to provide, I guess, a brief introduction. Um, I've been doing work um, around sort of media literacy and fact checking and information literacy for a number of years. I've been a librarian for 10 years, I think 11 years this year, actually, which is an exciting anniversary. Um, and I think I'd gotten really increasingly interested in ways information literacy could really be applied and the work that librarians do could be applied to a lot of critical moments we're all going through, whether it's this current AI boom or the rise in sort of mis and disinformation and other challenges we're all sort of facing in our information ecosystems and in teaching research skills to students. So I'd been fortunate enough to do some work with Sage previously, and we ended up collaborating together around a topic I was really passionate about, which is fact checking, which led us to the development of this new course. Um, it was a really, I think, interesting opportunity to use my uh, experiences and things I'd done in libraries sort of in a different format and to think about uh, conveying that information to learners through sort of a different medium. So i um, excited to chat with you all about sort of the process of that and sort of how that course kind of came to be and what you could see there. Um, in addition to the course itself, um, 
We worked on some facilitator guides, um, and this was important to me because as a librarian myself and who someone who's done library instruction for many years, I know it can be challenging to think about how to incorporate different resources, especially if you have time constraints or other kinds of considerations coming up. So I wanted to at least provide some ideas and a starting place for people to maybe consider how they could use these resources, how they can enhance things. Um, you know, you might already be doing or perhaps to approach a topic in a new way. So that's also something else we'll discuss today. Um, and yeah, finally, just wanted to note in terms of, you know, external resources for library instruction, this can involve, I think, a lot of different things. And I think sometimes we probably incorporate these items without necessarily realizing it or perhaps necessarily calling it. Um, that if you've ever, you know, pulled in examples or done sort of live social media resources in a class or looked up examples live, a lot of times we're always sort of pulling in these things into our instruction. So um, this is just one example of uh, many out there that you could consider as a way to you know, enhance certain aspects of your instruction. Something we'll touch on later is also free up some time potentially, or perhaps engage in more flipped classroom models. Um, the time crunch we all face in libraries, I'm sure many of you have done the dreaded one-shot instructions <laughs> over the years, and it can be so hard to cram everything in, and you have so many important topics you want to cover with students. So for me, at least, external resources like the Sage Campus course and other things we'll touch upon today can, I think, think hopefully open some doors for instruction opportunities, be a way to maybe take the uh, pressure off in some places and just be a way to um, open up some conversations around, I think, increasingly critical topics that I think are important for our learners to be exposed to and to engage with and things I think we're all passionate about in the profession as well. Um, so that was just a little about Again, the class itself has been a topic I've been interested in for a while, so we'll certainly talk more about how it came to be and what it entails, as well as other kinds of external resources you might be considering. And we'd love to hear from all of you if there's things you've used or things you're considering, um, you know, bringing into your instruction. So, uh, yeah, I guess I'll kick it over with Anna now. We can get our conversation going. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Great introduction there to your work. So um, I want to kind of preface this as kind of giving you an insight into sort of my role in this webinar today. Uh, as uh, Maria had introduced me, I am an engagement librarian currently employed with SAGE, although I do have a background in academic libraries for many years. And so um, I was invited to participate in this webinar when Maria said, hey, we're, we're inviting Sarah to come in and talk about her work and her collaboration with SAGE. And I work very closely with SAGE Campus in my current role and doing a lot of teaching and instruction to a library audience um, on how to use uh, SAGE Campus and also how to incorporate it into their own library instruction, but also to like um, engage with their faculty using this, uh, this resource and how they can incorporate it into their faculty coursework and teaching. So I was really intrigued about this opportunity, but we kind of wanted to um, frame this webinar more as a conversation. So my role will be here as facilitator for Sarah. We've prepared some questions in advance. And so um, I will be kind of moderating those questions um, to Sarah, and we'll have a conversation back and forth about where my experience comes in in academic libraries. Um, my background is primarily in collection development. That was sort of my niche and passion work. Um, however, I do a lot of database instruction to a library audience, as I said. And so I'm always really intrigued about how resources from sort of disparate uh, sources can be incorporated in instruction, whether your audience is primarily student facing, graduate or undergraduate, or if you work a lot in your work with uh, outreaching to faculty and doing instruction to faculty, or if you, like me, uh, specialize in sort of database instruction and how to help other librarians or library employees incorporate resources into their work, I think these are all relevant to today's webinar. So with Sarah's background as curriculum designer and instruction librarian and mine as collection development and database instructor, I think we're, um, we're hoping to get a nice wide range of perspectives in our conversation today. But as Sarah said, please do utilize the chat. Um, we'd love to hear your opinions, your experience, as we're going along, because we're going to just be sharing our own and sometimes touching base with the audience to see what you can contribute to the conversation as well. 
So uh, let me kick off with our first prepared uh, question. And by the way, I didn't mention we will have a section a little bit later where we pause our prepared questions and we'll turn those questions over to you. Maria is moderating the chat, so feel free to, to go ahead and pop your questions in there as, as thoughts occur to you. Uh, and then we'll pause towards the end of the webinar and we'll start addressing those questions. And either Sarah will answer myself or we'll kind of tag team it depending on the nature. All right, so Sarah, first <laughs> question over to you. If you would please tell us about your experience as a curriculum developer working on creating things like workshops for your faculty or students or researchers in general. Absolutely. So I I, I was sort of reflecting back in time when I got this question and sort of thinking about different experiences I've had. Um, I think I really credit a lot to my very first library job. So I was a first year experience librarian at Loyola University Chicago. And so a lot of my work was focused around incoming first year students, orientations, and really those kinds of introductory research skills experiences. Um, and I was given, I was fortunate that I was given a good bit of leeway in that position. And so really just started developing different kinds of workshops for students. And I was able to collaborate with um, first year English instructors and other kind of partners on campus to do workshops where students might be getting say extra credit for a class they were enrolled in. And so it was a really good experience in thinking about you know, the goals we had sort of in the library centered around things like the ACRL information literacy framework, which had actually just come out when I had started that job. So it was the sort of hot new thing. And then connecting that to the learning outcomes and goals maybe a professor had or a department had for their students. So that sort of mapping and thinking about how to develop something that could be enriching for students, but also met kind of a variety of different sorts of, of goals and outcomes and things like that was really fantastic, I think, sort of training and experience. And I had so much fun doing that that I really just kept it up ever, ever since. Um, and a lot of that work led me to um, some partnerships outside of libraries. So I mentioned I'd done some work with uh, um, the Mozilla Foundation. So I got tied in with them around 2016. And they were doing a lot around what they term web literacy at the time. But in looking over that content, it was basically just information literacy with slightly different different terms, which I'm sure we've sort of noticed before if you've uh, done library instruction and talked about digital literacy and all these different things. So it was a, a natural fit. And again, just a way to share a lot of, um, I guess, information and insights from work I did in libraries and kind of package it in different ways. That content was for high school audiences. So that was a great experience just to get, you know, more kind of practice and, and hands-on experience developing content for different audiences, different age ranges, working kind of different mediums. A lot of that was very online kind of games and um, online instruction based a couple of years, obviously before the pandemic really shifted many, many things <laughs> online. So, um, so yeah, I think a lot of those, I was able to leverage that into building campus partnerships during my time at Emory. So uh, that experience let me get on curriculum committees and I co-developed entire classes with, with colleagues there. We did one on um, kind of liberal arts skill, transferable liberal arts skills for students. And a huge component of that was how they could think about the research skills they're learning during their time at university and taking that into other job opportunities in the future, future career paths they wanted to pursue. Um, and another was a whole class on media literacy that we got approval for with somebody in the um, rhetoric department at Emory. And I, I really credit a lot of those early experiences and experience outside of libraries too, to helping me, um, I guess, be able to sort of present myself in the library as spaces where we can do this kind of work. We can we can think outside the box. We can collaborate with you and, and open the door for some other colleagues who then started doing some of that work themselves. So yeah, that was a really positive experience <laughs> in the end from that initial start at my first library job. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, there's so many things that you mentioned in that, that I just kind of want to like pick apart and learn more yeah. about. Um, but so kind of just to kind of tease some of those things out, you said you started yeah. as like a first year experience librarian. Yes. And I know, um, you know, that's, that's definitely an area that might be well represented with our audience today. Certainly one of the sure. areas that we at Sage focus on a lot is how can we support our first year 
um, success or first year experience, That's librarians, yeah. um, you know, facilitating their work with our resources. And so um, I'm kind of curious to kind of learn throughout your career, sort of specializing in instruction and instructional design and curriculum development. Would you say that your process evolved? Um, so this is a multi-part, apologies for multi-part okay. questions That's so okay. early on in the <laughs> webinar, but um, <laughs> would you say that your process for sort of preparing your design or your curriculum, or even like you said, like you, you kind of learned along the way to develop partnerships outside the library and become, you know, so many of us do that do outreach, do consider ourselves like advocates in yes. that role as librarian. So librarian advocate, kind of a slash or a hyphen there. Um, so I'm curious with your career development in this specialization. Ah. Did you did you evolve your process along the way yeah. uh, and kind of folding in external resources or or get inspiration from outside the library? And also part two of that question is, would you say your process differs depending on your intended audience, whether mm. you're teaching, like you said, for first year students or, you know, advanced research graduate students or faculty? Yeah. I love so, this yeah, this I know. I'm so sorry. I'm like, that was a huge long sentence. Thank for you. That's okay. Question, I, have, I, I, I can have, remind you if you need it. I'm armed with a pin. So I took, I okay. wrote some stuff down. So I don't forget. You can remind me though. Um, yeah, I absolutely love this question. I did want to just say, I love what you say about being um, sort of an advocate for the library. And I feel like it's something I've certainly kind of evolved in over the course of my career and something I'm really passionate about. Like, I just feel the libraries and the librarians and the work we do and the type of instruction we do is is so valuable, especially in today's world. Like so many of the topics we're hitting upon are so critical. So I always, I, I think I've developed over time where I've, and my role at Emory helped with this is really thinking about how to almost position, and I'm hesitant to use the term marketing ourselves, but in a way to to just, because there's misconceptions out there. A lot of times I'd be talking with faculty and I, I would mention, oh, we do instruction at the library. And they would have no idea what that entailed. They wouldn't necessarily know what could be possible there or what was on, on offer. And so um, to get back to your question, um, one, I think definitely I've, I evolved over time in thinking about how to kind of pitch things to different audiences. I, I remember having meetings back to my first job at Loyola and I would come in all excited. I was like fresh out of library school. So I was just, yep, I have all the ALA resources and I'm here to go and just like ready to go. <laughs> and I'd be talking about information literacy and stuff. And, you know, you see this vaguely glazed expressions or just sort of polite nodding. I was like, this is not, this is not landing. Um, so over time I would sort of experiment or listen to what they were saying and be like, yes, that connects with this for X, Y, Z reasons. And then you sort of see it click on and people said, oh yeah, this is a great collaboration. We are, people would say, we didn't realize you did that at the library. And so I, I think we certainly um, come across that a lot of times in different, you know, venues, particularly across say a university campus, different departments might have very different conceptions or be using different language sometimes. So mm. in my process, I really started thinking about not just who the audience, like the learning audience was, but who would be the potential like partner audience as well. Like, does this need to go to the English department? I need to kind of, you know, think about how to pitch that. Is this going to like the first year orientation office? They might have very different concerns or goals as students. And so we could just think about how to make those connections uh, clear. So I think that was something I kind of learned through experience and having a lot of failures and people just say, no, thank you <laughs> for collaboration. I'm like, okay, I need to try. Thanks. New for thanks. <laughs> exactly. Um, and in terms of for audience, I think, I mean, yeah, in some respects, the, some of the process is still the same for me. Like I have certain ways I like to work. And I imagine this is true for any educator or people who do curriculum. You just have kind of, you know, routines or, or beats you like to hit or, or approaches to to the material but I definitely always try to keep audience like really front and center for me so especially with for instance grad students I always try to recognize that they have to wear so many different hats they're, they're students themselves but a lot of times are also teaching as well or mm -hmm. they're, they're researchers in a much more advanced stage and so for workshops we do, you know, I might want to leave more time for, say, conversation and dialogue about challenges they're having as new instructors or, or things coming up, whereas sort of an early 
you know, first year student audience, you know, you have to sort of think, okay, are these terms even going to be familiar? Do we need to really kind of go back and define and have some, um, you know, set the stage for stuff? Would they be more open to certain kinds of activities, whereas a more adult audience might feel that was sort of silly or, you know, maybe not as appealing. So certainly some of those things I think come into play and I'll definitely adjust um, content accordingly. But yeah, both the intended audience for delivery of the content and then potential like partners or who else it has to go through, mm. um, I think definitely influences <laughs> a lot of how I might put things together. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, as you were mentioning that it hadn't occurred to me before I heard you say it, but would you consider um, some of those external organizations or partnerships to be external sources for your instructional design? For me, I actually do. Um, I, I mean, I could kind of see arguments different ways, but I think, yeah, sometimes people might think of, yeah, something external being completely outside of the library or the university environment entirely. But but for me, uh, certainly uh, I, another kind of example from Emory, they had this uh, um, you know, evolving kind of goal around student success and student flourishing. And we definitely tried to pull in the outcomes and language for that into mm -hmm. a sort of workshop program we did. So I was thinking if you're a student and you're being exposed to all this stuff already, and then you see these library workshops, it might help to say like, these hit like XYZ goals, or these mm -hmm. will help you achieve like these things. So uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Another example is I did a workshop with a career services at Emory, which people thought was really odd at first, but we were talking about using research skills to kind of aid in the, the job hunt as it were. So because you have to sometimes, you know, be able to figure out the correct search term to find the sort of maybe career area you're interested in or how to kind of parse listings and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, my colleague there was bringing in a ton of just kind of new frameworks and materials from like the um, American Association of uh, Colleges and Universities or, you know, different kinds of frameworks for, um, you know, uh, skills, transferable skills for entering the workforce and things that, you know, wouldn't normally have come up in a library instruction session, but were sort of used there to, to present these ideas. So I think 100% you could consider um, those external resources coming from with, uh, you know, across your campus, but outside the library. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's um, move into another question, sort of ah. the theme of our webinar today, which is based on your experience as an instructor, what challenges have you experienced in integrating third-party resources to enhance your library instruction? Absolutely. Um, a couple that come to mind are just, uh, I mean, time constraints is always, I think, a number one issue with a lot of library instruction. Um, we're often, you know, invited in maybe for part of a class or just kind of a one-off opportunity um, if you're doing kind of course-based instruction. And so just having enough time to you know, there's some really fantastic games out there, for example. Um, I do a lot around kind of myths and disinformation and media literacy. And there, there's some fun, you know, online games from like Cambridge University and different places, but you need a chunk of time in order to kind of get through that and have that experience. And if you're kind of already pressed for time, it can be sort of hard to kind of fit that in. Um, I think another thing that can be a challenge is sometimes just getting consensus and buy-in with materials and just, you know, making sure that you're not, say, reinventing the wheel or that the resources are going to kind of, you know, enhance what's already sort of happening. Um, we've certainly, you know, I've had experiences before where we might come across something in the library and people say, well, I'm already kind of doing that. I don't need this new thing or, you know, not, not really kind of understanding, like, what is this about? I'm, I'm busy. I don't have time to learn that. I guess that's a time issue as well, because you need time to get people sort of <laughs> feeling comfortable if there's an external resource and feeling on board with it. So um, I think those are a couple of, of challenges that have certainly uh, come up for me, just kind of that buy-in, figuring out, okay, how are we using this in an effective way and just finding time to do it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've had that as well. Um, yeah. I just want to remind the audience that the chat is there for y'all. We want to hear from you um, to kind of share what your particular challenges are. I'd love to go ahead and pop it into the chat. That way we can add it to our list and yeah. commiserate together or, you know, react <laughs> to exactly. um, maybe some, some shared grievances or challenges. 
when I thought about this question, um, and, and this one always comes to mind, and in fact, we were just discussing as the webinar was starting before the audience members joined us today, um, that when you're doing, especially online instruction, or you're using a lot of electronic resources in your instruction, technology or technology malfunction is a huge challenge. <laughs> so one of the things that came immediately to mind when I'm planning my uh, instruction and using external resources is really sometimes websites malfunction. Am I right? Like sometimes you're you're like, oh, I'm going to incorporate this external source, you know, some other website or an organization's information page or whatever it happens to be. And that website is not loading. <laughs> and you're kind of stuck in that moment. You know, we already know that this is a challenge when the library is responsible for maintaining a website. For example, if you're demonstrating a LibGuide or you're going to the library chat or whatever it happens to be, you know, sometimes you're going to run into technical difficulties, but yeah. those are those are sources that the library can control and kind of troubleshoot on our own. But, you know, integrating third-party resources means you don't have control over those websites when you're working and you're showing them in class. Or, you know, for example, afterwards, if you compile a list of sources that you're sharing out with your, um, with your students, uh, you don't guarantee that they're going to continue to work. So, you know, that kind of led me into other challenges that I've experienced, which is like properly vetting your sources for quality and accuracy. Yeah. This is already a challenge to librarians. Um, in addition to researchers, we kind of share that that same um, challenge to making sure that our sources are credible and that they're they continue to be maintained and accurate. And so I think when you're planning instruction around external sources, like you just have to be that much extra diligent, right? Um, and so that diligence does take time, which adds to like Sarah's comment about just like the, the time it takes, you know, to sometimes uh, not just time, do I have enough time in, in my session to go over everything I need to, but like, do I have enough time to diligently prepare everything if I'm called into a session on short notice, right? So, um, that's always a unique challenge there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, speaking of technologies, I also thought about technology integration, which I think it was a conversation we had together, Sarah, in preparation for this webinar. We were talking about like technology can either enhance or hinder the information yeah. literacy process. Yes. Um, so one of my challenges is trying to find a good balance of innovative technology with also the ease of use on the learner's behalf. And Absolutely. again, that depends on the audience. Like, like Sarah said, if you've got like a novice researcher, you can, you're going to want to sort of go back to basics and not, you know, expand too much beyond yeah. the set. But if you've got advanced researchers, maybe it's a, like a graduate level research course and they're working on dissertations, like you're definitely yeah. going to want to bring in the big guns. Or for somebody that. doing challenge really them. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, yes. I was thinking someone doing really advanced, like work with data and needing like data management resources. Right. Like, that right. And making sure that you're vetting that, which is why I always rely on my colleagues who tend to specialize in those areas for their advice and input. Like, what would you recommend <laughs> in this particular case? Absolutely. I, uh, I just to say quickly, I love the point you brought up about, you know, needing to vet your resources. And I think one, one tricky thing that's come up for me, because I've, I've taught classes on things like you know, misinformation before. So we're, we're almost sometimes deliberately bringing in content that, that isn't good. Like as like a teachable moment, it's like, you know, this is some like bogus site. And a lot of times that stuff gets taken down or, you know, and so you're constantly trying to like find examples and, and resources to kind of do that effectively or illustrate things. I'm thinking now of things like generative AI, if you're trying to bring that in and you're like, is this working? Like, how are we able to get this? And you don't want to ignore that because it's such a part of the information ecosystem we're all in and something students experience. But I can also understand why it's sometimes easier to go back to stuff the library has actual control <laughs> over right. in session. So you're not opening that door for kind of, you know, more yeah. chaos coming in. So that's why, yeah, vetting like, good third-party resources that maybe get into some of those issues or introduce things so you're not on the hook for some live right. demo that doesn't go according to plan can be interesting. It, yeah. it is tempting to kind of stay with the tried and true, but I mean, <laughs> and the, I think the theme of one of the purposes of this webinar is really to demonstrate that it's like worth that extra effort because yeah. it enriches your instruction. <laughs> sure. Um, but it is like one of my last challenges here that I thought that came yes. to mind was like what you said, Sarah, how do I stay current and up to date with new uh -huh. content to make sure that like, <laughs> 
my own instruction session doesn't go stale, right? Like we, we all, if we work with faculty have experienced that sort of reticence for faculty to, to like change their syllabus on a regular basis or update content. And I think librarians have the same challenges where we say, no, I've done this workshop. It, it's tried and true, it works, but we have to make sure that we are challenging ourselves to totally. refresh that content. And and like you said, are all those resources that I added still usable or have they exactly. like said, disappeared or gone stale or whatever it happens to be? So you have to like invest the time to keep it fresh. For sure, yeah. Yeah. So um, on the flip side of that, I want to hear yes. from you, Sarah, sort of what benefits uh, presented themselves by using third-party resources? So rather than the challenges, like what did you get out of it? Absolutely. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but sometimes it can oddly enough free up time for, for additional things. So if you, mm. for instance, have something you could uh, maybe introduce for students to explore or do in advance. Um, I had a colleague at Emory who tended to always do kind of uh, pre-test surveys for, for classes, um, but he worked in kind of the film and media department. And so he would often kind of highlight maybe you have them watch something and then respond to it. And as a, he could have done that in the class session, but it was just a great way to kind of generate some conversation in advance and get people kind of feeling good about the session, coming in with questions. And then he was able to spend that much more time just having conversations with students and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, I, I've worked with some other colleagues and did some work uh, with them about getting stuff into Canvas. So that was the learning management system we had at, at um, Emory. Um, and again, you know, you work with the faculty, which could build close ties there. Maybe you introduce some kind of module or something students could learn and go through. Um, just before that class session or as a follow-up sometimes too, you might think like, okay, this is really kind of a tricky topic. Let's sort of talk about this first, but then you have something they could do afterwards or maybe some like a, a quiz they could take. Uh, that class I developed with some colleagues at Emory on transferable liberal arts skills. One of the things we had students do is it was sort of a self-assessment, like a skills assessment. And they were able to kind of map it onto their uh, schedule at Emory and just think about what am I getting out of my current classes that could help me achieve my future goals? And are there skills on this list that I haven't had an opportunity to get yet? And then we provide them with things like a list of library workshops and other spaces and be like, okay, yeah, do you have this goal? Like, here's some resources. Think about how you can maybe achieve that. And that was just like a follow-up activity we had yeah. them do. So again, I think that flipping and opening up some time for discussion in class can help. Sorry, you're going to say something. Yeah, no, I just, I really love that. Like I want to <laughs> express my admiration for that yeah. technique because I think one of, one of the hardest things that, that maybe we don't get around to doing in like a one shot, like you said, is like the follow through or the connecting the dots on how what we're doing in the classroom or what we're, what services the library is providing is um, directly related to their goals that they are, you know, yeah. trying to achieve. And so I think being really explicit and being upfront about, Hey, you have these markers or milestones that you need to meet, you know, even having that like list for a student that says your, your goal is this, like your skill yeah. building is this, here's yeah. where the library can help you with direct connections there. Really? It's just, like it, it, it's saving the time of the, of the, the student, but also I think demonstrating that value that the library is bringing to the scholarly community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and just sort of, uh, I did a class one time on project management skills for kind of research projects because it was for students doing senior theses. And so they're working on this for the whole year, which was brand new for some students. So it's like, yeah, you really have to think about your time management and how you're organizing everything because this isn't a project you could just you know, put aside and come back to you at the end of the year and just magically, <laughs> magically finish it, you're going to have to keep going and really think things out. And, and I, at first I, and I have this impulse too, because I love developing stuff and teaching and like develop all these things, all these resources. And I was like, I don't have time for this. And I was like, let me just look around. And there, there's tons out there on project management. I was like, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I can pull in some perfectly great resources from other schools to share and have like workbooks with students and whatever. And it just, freed me up to do <laughs> other that's, tests, so, that's yeah. exactly where I was going with this when I thought about the benefits for my instruction yeah. um 
for me, it's like, I, I benefit so much from another creator's expertise and creativity, yeah, yeah. right? Like you said, why do I need to reinvent the wheel or try to yeah. become an expert in something that I haven't devoted years of, of research and practice to, if I can go out there and find some other librarian or scholar or author or researcher who's already developed something that is, that is amazing, that's going to yeah. be easily incorporated into something I'm trying to do in class. I love what you say about sort of sparking creativity because I've had some experience too where we maybe brought in some external resource, I think uh, maybe use some videos from another school to like illustrate kind of a research topic or what have you. Uh, but then it would end up sparking something. And, you know, one time we did a spinoff sort of workshop based off of that other resource. So we were still sort of coming in with our own creativity and things, but kind of utilizing that resources as a springboard. And so I think, again, sometimes it can feel like, oh, I wanted to do this, or I love doing this. I want to present my expertise, but sometimes it can be a way to either spark new ideas or, or enhance yeah. expertise. Like that project management workshop, it was still the library putting it together and talking about how we could support researchers. So from the faculty perspective, it was like, oh, this is a great new avenue. I hadn't realized you could all do this kind of work with researchers, you know, let's have some more uh, it was actually an extra workshop. I did a session for her and came back to do that project management thing specifically. Mm -hmm. So those external resources actually opened the door for, for more instruction in, in that instance. So it doesn't necessarily shut a door or kind of shut the library out of it. It can sort of be a way to maybe right. hide areas of expertise or spin off projects or things like or that. At the, at the very least, it diversifies your own instruction, right? Yeah, so yeah. It, it can help like, provide different viewpoints or perspectives that maybe you didn't think about that subject matter that you're teaching. Yeah. Um, and I think it helps to like shake it up, you know, like shake things up on your own instruction style. Absolutely. So yeah. That's yeah. another great benefit from, from incorporating other people's work. For sure. Yeah. So did, did any opportunities kind of catch you by surprise that you weren't expecting or maybe were like unplanned consequences? Yeah, I think, you know, some sometimes it was just like partnerships that could emerge or, around different sorts of, of things. Um, I mentioned that, you know, career center uh, collaborative workshop um, I did at Amory or sort of working with those uh, other partners around that um, yeah, transferable liberal arts skills class. Um, those kinds of connections and kind of working with other resources, it just sort of opened the door for further collaboration. So that work ended up, you know, getting me and some other librarians on curriculum committees and things like that. So it just sort of um, things I wouldn't have anticipated or additional project that popped up just because we'd done sort of that initial, you know, joint effort around something it really kind of took off in interesting ways. Um, I also think, you know, again, things like you know, spinoff projects or even sort of rearranging content sometimes. And by that, I mean, maybe we found a resource that we could put into Canvas or put in a LibGuide or kind of move somewhere to to highlight expertise sort of outside of maybe the t confines of a classroom, um, just with enabled maybe more people to then find like, oh, this is what we're about, or this is what we're doing, or just open the door for even more collaborations and connections. So I think, yeah, a lot of it was just um, yeah, opportunities to engage in dialogue with different partners or to spin off in different directions or present content in different ways to, to students that could then just sort of keep rolling on from there. So I, I found that really interesting as I, you know, engage with different kinds of resources in my instruction. Great. Um, just a quick question. Uh, I seem to be frozen, but can y'all hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. I can hear you. Great. Yeah. Okay. Is my video still on? Yes, you're good. Okay, yeah. Good. Then we'll keep going. My screen is frozen, but oh, no. that's okay. okay. <laughs> Again, technology okay. challenges. It's um, all challenges. Yeah. <laughs> I I did. Oh, are you still there? Yes. Okay. Um, for some reason, my screen went blank. Oh no. Okay. Well, I think I have my other question prepared, which is okay. Hey, what what motivated you to um, create those facilitator guides that you yes. had introduced when you were talking about your work with Sage? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, you know, the experience developing this sort of fact-checking course, I think was, was something I was really passionate about because it's a topic 
I, I feel strongly about and think it can be really fantastic for librarians to cover. But again, whether due to time or how fast things are evolving kind of in that space, it can be a little overwhelming. So some of that was the impetus for doing the course itself. But then when I saw it done, it's like I said, I wanted to just really think through different scenarios that maybe a librarian could encounter and just think about how it doesn't have to be a one size fits all solution. It doesn't have to be, you know, you have to use this course in this way. Um, I'd love for it to just be something that can maybe spark ideas and people can take and adapt and use in, in different ways, whether it's like a, one activity out of it or the whole thing, or they see an opportunity to flip a classroom with it, or um, it, it sparks an idea for how they might tackle this topic through a workshop series or, you know, whatever comes to mind. So a lot of the impetus for the facilitator guide was just to get some of those ideas out there and hopefully spark people to start brainstorming and thinking and kind of reusing and using that material um, themselves. Um, and again, I know how it can be you know, sometimes you see something really cool, but it can feel sort of daunting to you. How do I fit this in? Or I'm so swamped. I don't know what to do with this. I don't really have time to, you know, right. uh, you know, reflect on all of that. And so I just at least wanted to supply some starting ideas or a starting point uh, for people. So that was definitely, I think, some of the goals that went into that uh, facilitator yeah. guide, really just to empower librarians to uh, take ownership of the content and make it their own and see if they could use it in a way that could benefit what they're already doing or enhance something or open the door for trying something new um, as well. I was so excited when I saw that you were working on these guides um, <laughs> for Sage because one of my, um, so two parts, like I'm big on process and creating procedure wow. documents it's, just, it's kind of my thing but I love um, it. The, the goal of it is really to, like to fine-tune workflow and for to, to emphasize process improvement anything that can facilitate the work of librarians to um like work smarter you know and kind of more effectively or efficiently um to reduce the workload I, that's I'm just a big supporter of that um and second part on that is because in my current work as engagement librarian I'm constantly working with librarians in uh, like accounts across the country who say how am I supposed to incorporate you know Sage Campus courses into my existing yeah. um instruction program and so this was like the the meeting of the minds on this this facilitator <laughs> guide project that you worked on with Sage because it's exactly the kind of thing that I would love to point to other librarians who have Sage Campus to say, like, here you go. Like, this is a great guide to help you get started or to inspire you or to give you examples about how other librarians are doing it. Um, and I just think that that's just such good and necessary work. So thank you for your facilitator guides. Um, and I look forward to sharing them with all of the librarians that I work with on behalf of Sage. Hey. Uh, yeah, so... Um, at this point, we are coming to kind of that time in the webinar where I'd love to turn questions over to our audience. Now, um, Maria, over to you. Do we have any questions in the chat? Um, not just yet, but we had a few questions that came up when people were registering to the oh, webinar. Cool. So uh, we, can, we can look at some of those. Um, so the first question that we had was, uh, oh, wait. Where did that go? <laughs> I think technology is not not our friend today. I know it's building. <laughs> um, so the first question that we had was, "What is a good resource?" And this might be quite a specific request, but uh, what is a good resource for Spanish and other language versions of scripts plays? Mm. So I love that someone, whoever it was, submitted this question, and I hope that they are attending live today. If not, that's okay, um, because um, in my former work at my prior um, institution, I was, at least for part of the time, the liaison to the College of the Arts and the Theater and Performing Arts Department, and that is my discipline background. I have a, an undergraduate degree in theater, and so I love getting these types of reference questions. <laughs> Um, because it I don't get to, to do much of that. Anymore. Right. And so like, I had to like dig back into old lib guides and things like that to see what, what would I have used back then? And, and what would I recommend? And so, um, especially since like the intersection of theater and performing arts and foreign language materials is just so very niche. Right. So, um, 
as a collections librarian, obviously my brain first goes to, to databases. And so if you've ever heard of something called like drama online database, that's one that I absolutely will endorse. Um, I um, had access to it for many, many years and uh, that's where my brain goes to first, but there's also other more like different language ones called like digital guide to theater in the Middle East database, for example. Now, if you're looking at external resources, third party resources for Spanish language, there is a site called Obras Cortas and you can browse by theme, um, the number of players. So I know like if you are, um, coaching students in theater or performing arts they often have to choose plays based on like oh i have to do like a presentation in class with three other classmates right so you you kind of have to find a play where there's at least three characters in that scene um so that's a really great browsing tool for for theater students is you can browse plays by the number of players in it so you know you'll have enough um, or you can browse that particular resource for like youth or juvenile age appropriate works as well, which is really nice. And then the other one that I thought of is called Stage Plays. Now this one isn't like an open source. It's more like a um, an online catalog where you can order scripts in print or in, in like e, e, uh, format, the electronic format. And the nice thing is the reason I bring it up is you can browse by nation. So not necessarily just oh. Spanish language, but, you know, there's like all sorts of different options. Like, I think I saw there, like, you can browse Welsh, you can browse like Indonesian, like all sorts of different um, global positions and things like that. So those are ones that sort of came to mind. I am going to grab some links that I have prepared and I'm going to pop them in the chat. Give me one second while I pull up the chat. That way, hopefully... Yeah. everything will come through. So yeah. And also, I mean, I, those are just a few that I prepared this morning when I saw that the question came through, I would love to hear from the audience. If anyone does have knowledge in this particular area, uh, please do share in the chat because uh, honestly, like we've been saying, Sarah and I pooling our knowledge and learning from each other is kind of one of the best things librarians do. So yeah. <laughs> those, those are my initial suggestions. Yeah. Anna, I just had a thought that come to mind when you were sharing all that, because I definitely had conversations with colleagues before about, you know, we have all these like wonderful databases and resources at our library that we, we subscribe to and we want to highlight for sure. But I think increasingly given, you know, so much around generative AI and things like that, you, it can be helpful to have librarians and experts sort of vet other kinds of third-party resources that could be out there. So even just what you just shared, being able to sort of say like, here's what's good about this and here's how this works and just share it because so much, yes. um, yeah, there's a lot out there now that people could just be coming across that uh, might be of somewhat varying degrees of quality. So even just- Yeah, again, with the, the vetting and the quality control. And I, I, I try to do my due diligence, at least with the two um, that are external sources. Um, I did check what was the copyright on that? How recently was it updated yes. and who was responsible, right? So um, I, I did my um, initial due diligence on that. But one of the things I like about some of these third-party sources, especially with theater and performing arts or foreign language materials, is they're sort of labors of love by whoever it was that put that website right. together. Yeah. So it's a passion project. Um, so it might not necessarily be updated as regularly, but you know it's uh, for the most part, the ones that I found, they're well-intentioned, right? Because they're like, we want to build a community here. We want to make sure that these resources are accessible and discoverable for an audience that maybe like you can't get the mainstream, right? Because a lot of these um, foreign language materials, they're not going to be in your just your standard database or your yeah. um, the, the one resource that most people know about. So they're kind of specialized in niche. And so you, you have these communities on the internet that try to like um compile this information and then put it out into the world just out of like a need to to open source that information and i'm I already think thinking beautiful. how you could pull that into instruction session itself yes. and talk about like information <laughs> ecosystems and yes. you know how communities and conversations emerge right, right. just use the resource itself as <laughs> the topic of instruction it's fantastic so cool yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you, Anna, for those. I think they are really, they look like really great resources. So uh, I'm sure everyone's going to check them out. Um, we also had a question um, 
that came through the registration form about Sage Campus integration with Canvas. Uh, mm. So uh, this is a great opportunity to actually uh, address this. So uh, we are rolling out um, LTI integration for Sage Campus in end of March, April. Um, so Canvas will come with that. So um, we are we're going to send out communications about it when it's available. And uh, but this is a very exciting. Um, uh, new thing for for us at campus and something we wanted to do for for a long time. We we had, you know, this was feedback that we had heard from uh, from librarians. So um, we we made sure to to sort of uh, make sure that it it happens. So it's coming, and we're going to announce more soon. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah. Um, thanks, That's Marie. fantastic to hear. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah. Oh no, I was just um, seeing the time. So we have about five minutes ah, left. So maybe yeah. uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. What do you all yeah. think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not I'm not seeing any questions come in chat. So maybe I'll just go back yeah. to one of the ones that I wanted to ask Sarah. And I thought that this question would be perfect for anyone in the audience who maybe is really curious about becoming an author on a Sage Campus course. And so, Sarah, what was it like going through the process and working as an instructor for a Sage Campus course? Um, how was your experience? Like, what were your impressions yeah. or kind of just general, you know? For sure. Feedback? Yeah, no, I found it, I found it a really rewarding experience. And I'd say, I mean, for me, I was, I'm always eager to find ways to continue growing my skills and curriculum development and instructional design and things of that nature. So it was such a great, I think, just opportunity and space to continue sort of growing in those areas. Um, everyone I worked with was delightful and really supportive and friendly. So, you know, if you're sort of I don't know, wanting to dip a toe in that area and for me too, just thinking about ways to maybe take instruction and work I've done in libraries and, you know, uh, envision how it could be, you know, conveyed to different kinds of learners through different kinds of platforms and mediums. And the course itself involves some video recording and involved lots of mm -hmm. games and activities. So uh, it was sort of, it was just a fun opportunity for me, at least to kind of maybe put some things that I'd done sort of in in-person classes before and think about how that could translate into an online environment for a learner. So I feel like I learned a lot that I could take back into my work in libraries and like future instruction and designing content for students, whether in Canvas or LibGuides or what have you. And it was just, yeah, a really just great learning experience, I think, for personal and professional growth and just a chance to, you know, uh, kind of work around content that I'm really passionate about and that, you know, maybe wouldn't have as much opportunity just in my regular day-to-day -day job to just delve into that so deeply. So uh, yeah, overall, I mean, if anyone is interested. I'd certainly be happy to answer questions if anyone, you know, is thinking about doing something like that. But on the whole, if you if you have an interest in those kinds of areas like curriculum development, instructional design, or maybe a topic you're really passionate about and want to explore further, um, I found this just to be a really rewarding opportunity personally. So great. Thanks, Sarah. I'm really looking forward to reviewing your course because um, I, I can sign up as a learner on Sage campus and go through it. And so I I'm to excited to hear so it. I'm think. looking forward yeah. to learning more about fact checking. Um, Giving feedback. Uh, yeah, this would be good. It's such a huge topic. And I mean, with, you know, AI and all these things happening now, conversations happening in libraries, I felt like it was, uh, um, hopefully good timing <laughs> for people to engage with the content and think about it. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, do we want to wrap up there or um, one more question? What do you think, Maria? It's your webinar. Um, I think we, I think we might need to wrap up there. Totally um, good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. um, but thank you both so much. Let me just uh, open up the slides and you can let me know if you can see, is it showing correctly? Oh, we've got um, your notes. Oh, yeah. that's not what we want. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, let's try that again. Fun with technology as always. Oh, always, <laughs> always. Uh, <laughs> always. Uh, what about there? You still yes. say we're yes, good. Yes, it's showing up great now. Yeah. Cool. Um, yes. Yeah, so since you were talking about the course, I just thought I would just uh, quickly um, mention that this is now available on Sage Campus. 
Um, we're really excited about this course. It, it's, uh, it's such an important topic, as Sarah has uh, mentioned many times today. Um, and it's uh, we we have uh, it, it's it's a very 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 good course. Um, it's available on on the platform now. So if you uh, wait, let's go. So if your university already subscribes to Sage Campus, um, you can get access to it straight away. Um, and if you would like to try uh, campus uh, for your institution, uh, we do have a 30 um, day trial uh, to librarians. So we're going to include the links on our follow up email with the recording as well. So uh, watch out for that. Um, and I also just wanted to mention that we're going to have another webinar coming up very soon with Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, again. Um, <laughs> <Happy to come. laughs> <laughs> We're just going to be talking about fact checking sources. Um, so this is uh, this is going to be a very important webinar, um, and we're going to share the link to register after again in the same email. Uh, but please feel free to share them, share it with students and faculty. This is going to be very much uh, addressing the um, the sort of students and learners. So um, feel free to set, share it uh, widely. And I just wanted to say thank you to both Sarah and Anna for this. This was a really great discussion. Um, thank you so much for your time and, and your expertise. Um, I hope everyone has learned something and taken something from, from this webinar. And I hope to see you next time. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.